I love my grandma a lot, but we've been having a bit of an argument lately. She's Eurosceptic, meaning that she opposes the UK's membership of the European Union or EU and will probably vote for Brexit for the UK to leave the EU. This video is a way of explaining myself to her, but more generally it's a case for voting to stay in the EU on the 23rd of June. There are two promises I want to make about this video. I'll use neither language tricks nor tricky language, neither politician sound bites from whichever side, nor technical jargon, I'll only use the best evidence from the best sources, but I'll make it as understandable as I can without in any way dumbing down the debate. So first up, economics. It's easy when David Cameron says the economy to think of a stream of numbers going in and out of the government, but that's not really what the economy is. The economy is me and you. It's your friends and your family, your siblings and your community. Economics is not about how we can increase a bunch of figures on a screen, it's about our happiness, our quality of life, and eventually how we can all work together to achieve a better and more prosperous world. I have to use cold statistics and boring phrases, but let's not forget that when we discuss economics, what we're really talking about is how long you're going to live how educated your children are going to be, and yes, how rich you are. With that in mind, there are good reasons to think that people will change their vote if they think that vote will make them worse off. We know that the economic case against Brexit is pretty overwhelming, and yet the majority of people don't think that their standard of living will decrease if we leave the EU. You'll never get all economists agreeing on an issue, particularly on big political questions. But on Brexit, there's almost complete consensus among academic economists and respected groups that leaving the EU would make the British people significantly poorer than they would be otherwise. I could refer you to the London School of Economics, or the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, or the OECD, or the Treasury, or PwC, or Oxford Economics, or the Bank of England, or the International Monetary Fund, or the World Bank, or the World Trade Organization you get the picture. The Centre for Economic Performance thinks that household losses will be somewhere between £850 and £1,700, although they think those losses are probably too optimistic, and that's roughly in line with every other major analysis. The idea that Brexit would save £50 million a day to spend on the NHS is in direct opposition to essentially all of the experts and the actual figures, and whilst Boris Johnson refuses to apologise for these lies, 280 mostly academic economists have written a letter saying that Brexit would be a major mistake. So what's the other side of the argument? The initial argument is that economists have made many bad predictions, but economists do add value to the guesses of politicians, and we're talking about things like less trade with the EU, which is almost definitely true and almost definitely bad. Next is that these groups are biased, either by each other or because they belong to the establishment, but this also seems silly because one, all of these economists who agree on Brexit disagree on essentially everything else and two, because reputable groups like the IFS have hardly been champions for establishment policy. Then, if people get really desperate, they point to economists for Brexit, which is rubbish for reasons that, just like everything else in this video, I'll link in the description below. And finally, the argument turns to trade deals. In the papers I showed earlier, there are essentially four reasons why you'll probably be poorer if we leave the EU. The first is uncertainty. Businesses didn't spend after the recession because they didn't know how it would work out for them if they gave you a job because they didn't know when people would start buying all their stuff. In the same way, not knowing what the UK will look like after leaving the European Union stops businesses from spending money and giving people jobs. The second reason is that businesses in places like Asia invest here, which gives people jobs and the government money to spend on schools and hospitals and stuff, because the UK gives them access to half a billion customers in Europe. The UK is well ahead of Germany here, and top officials openly say that Brexit would hurt investment into the UK. The third reason is a big one, trade. I'm not going to get into the really technical stuff, but I just want to get past the three Eurosceptic trade arguments. Firstly, the UK will not beat the EU into giving it a trade deal which offsets the cost of leaving. The important fact here is that the UK accounts for 10% of the stuff that the EU sells, but the EU accounts for almost 50% of the stuff that we sell. We're not going to accept free movement, so we're not going to take a trade deal like Norway's, where they have to accept EU regulations, where they pay into the EU almost as much per person 
person as we do and where trade is lower than if they were in the EU. On the other end of the scale, countries that don't accept free movement don't have trade deals that include services which are particularly important to the UK. And the EU, which frequently puts politics ahead of economics, has massive incentives to give us a bad deal. The second point about trade is that the EU will not enter a golden age of trade with non-EU countries if it leaves. There's a lot to say here, but the key points are best summarised by the only person that I can find giving actual insight into actual trade deals, Miriam Gonzalez Durantes. She notes that the UK hasn't really needed to negotiate its own trade agreement since the 1970s, so we don't really have the expertise for it, and even if we did, it would take at least a decade. Moving from 500 million customers to 67 million customers is a breach of contract that other countries would be crazy not to renegotiate, and world leaders are clearly suggesting that trade would be better in than out. The third and easily most boring trade argument is about regulation. But the argument that EU regulations slow down the UK doesn't really mean anything when the net benefit of those regulations is 25 billion, when the costly ones are things like renewable energy, which we wouldn't scrap anyway, and when the UK is one of the countries least burdened by regulation. Going back to the reasons you'll probably be poorer than otherwise if Brexit goes ahead, the fourth and final reason the academic and policy papers give is that, perhaps surprisingly, EU immigration has been positive for the UK. The immigration line from the Brexit campaign is about taking control of our borders and reducing mass migration to the UK. I'll touch on other arguments later, but just like previously, I can't find any sensible economic arguments against immigration without basically discarding all of the evidence we have about it. There is little or no evidence that EU immigration has had a negative effect on jobs or the average wages of people born in the UK and lots of reason to believe that UK born people have benefited from EU immigration. EU migrants are disproportionately in work of working age and pay into the system which gives schools, hospitals etc more than they take out because young working people don't need as much from the NHS and obviously they don't take pensions. After that, benefit tourism is a myth and lower immigration would lead to higher taxes and or worse, not better services because immigrants to the UK are more educated than the original population. I get that a more open world comes with downsides. Trade threatens a small but important minority of workers, working across countries inevitably lessens the sovereignty of individual national governments, and immigration can represent a real social cost to communities. When voting, you have to weigh up these issues. But we know that openness has done, and will do, more good than bad, and that politicians appear committed to protecting certain industries from trade. The exception to the immigrants have been good for the UK rule is a small drop in wages for low-wage UK-born workers, and for sure we should be fully supporting them. My impression is that sovereignty arguments are better than economic or immigration ones, but they often ignore the reality that in today's world there's a direct trade-off between sovereignty and power, where the ability to decide more of your own stuff means losing the power over the bigger picture, and anyway, Britain gets its way most of the time. Countries do not and cannot control everything that affects them. That's why we're happy to sign up to organisations like NATO and the United Nations, who in their own way limit our sovereignty by making us commit to defence spending or sanctions, but overall they benefit us. Absolutely, let's fight for a better and more democratic European Union. Unelected politicians in Brussels have made mistakes on the Euro, on what I think is the indefensible bullying of Greece, and on Eastern European democracy, but walking away from the decision-making table is not the answer. Further, who will we be giving that power to if we leave? To Boris Johnson, who presumably only you turned on the EU to support his bid to become the next Prime Minister? Besides, we control all the important stuff anyway. Our military, our education system, our police, our NHS, our economic policy, a veto on new countries joining the EU, being exempt from ever closer union without a national referendum. As for social costs of immigration, I guess you have to consider. Is it worth being less well off in order to avoid immigrants in your community? Is it worth some combination of lower pensions, worse healthcare, and probably over £1,000 less in your pocket than would have been the case if we didn't leave the EU? So for me, Grandma, the case for remaining in the EU is beyond reasonable doubt. I hope this video has helped convince you, but either way, please register to vote before the deadline on the 7th of June. Otherwise, remember that all revenue from this channel goes to charity, so if you want to add to the £500 donated so far to the most effective charities in the world, my link is down in the description below. More selfishly, hit like, subscribe and share if you 
enjoyed, follow my politics Twitter at Joel Salomon, and I guess I'll catch you for the next video.